Hello and welcome to my channel today, thanks to the kindness of my patrons, I bring you a showcase of all the Stormcaller weapons linked to a bunch of achievements for the High Legions in the Ice Brood Saga's No Quarter episode. Now whilst you enjoy some eye candy, I thought I'd read to you some more and perhaps wax a little rhapsodic about Guild Wars' most notorious race, the Char. Now the Char are a militaristic culture, shocker right? And the society, technology and relationships are very much focused on supporting war. Humanity in the real world has leapt forward many times off the back of the inventions of war, so, so do not underestimate their creativity and advancements. Now, Char society is built around military units, which Char are indoctrinated into at an astonishingly young age. Now, non-military tasks such as farming and trading can be left to the young, the retired and the injured, but no matter a child's vocation, they are always viewed as a soldier and often view their life through that lens. Weakness and foolishness from individuals is viewed with contempt and in particular cases can result in a char becoming a gladium or in the worst case, a Char's name being stricken from the race's history. Now Char, on occasion, will mate for life, but most relationships are more casual than that. Families are recognised, but adult Char's have very little contact with their parents or offspring, but sometimes keep tabs on each other for events which could reflect badly on the family's reputation. It is an honour-focused culture. As soon as a cub is weaned, now, as soon as a cub is weaned, which is around about one year old, they enter the Farrah of one of their parents' legions. The Farrah is the cub's first warband, and they are trained as a military unit under supervision of an adult and are considered an adult when the warband no longer needs supervision, which is Lord of the Flies on steroids. So the cubs are taught to unify and define their own social structures and the warband shares a root name which they incorporate into their surname. Whilst ancestry is known and acknowledged, parents have little to do with the raising of their cubs in the Legion and as such warbands are viewed as a child's family and the bonds of loyalty and kinship formed between them are stronger than those of other races' families. Though some char leave, change or lose their warbands, these strong bonds usually have a deep impact on the char. Char changing warbands must change their name and fitting quickly if they are to survive. However, char have been known to choose the fate of becoming a gladium rather than risking losing those bonds again. I've said it many times, but char society is brutal. Now, when the oppression of a female char by the Flame Legion ended, male and female char were once again viewed as equals. Male and female char do not differentiate themselves through wearing different tailored or styled clothing. Collectively, the char are incredibly industrious, their forging superior even of that to the dwarves, and they are renowned and feared for their military technology weapons development, war machines, mass production, having pioneered the creation of airships and submarines. Their rifles and pistols are particularly finely made, however not all of their achievements involve weapons. They also make some of the finest clockwork and steam-driven devices, interior, and Scarlet herself went to study at the Black Citadel for just that reason. Their developments in technology eventually led to the printing press, which in turn propagated the widespread use of the Crichton language and the Crichton Herald. While the average char is willing to embrace technology, many view the use of magic as a sign of weakness and will distrust magic users as a whole, which is why the Flame Legion is going to struggle to integrate back into the High Legions. But time will tell. Now much of the char lands have been converted into ranches and fields for herding and growing food in the winter for their animals, cattle, sheep, warthogs, dolliacs, devourers are their primary sources of food. They even have a meat festival apparently. Meat Toberfest. Yummy. 
Now, religion. So due to their history, many Cha shun religion. They do not accept any god's authority and quickly anger on the mention of topics of Cha worship or manipulation by god-like beings. Now, Cha acknowledge other races' gods being powerful beings, but they do not see them as worthy of worship. In the case of the human gods, the Cha view these deities of beings to fight and strive to kill. At best, their reverence and respect is limited to only the great heroes and their deeds in their history, such as Pyre Fierce Shot and Callus Scorch Razor, notable Cha war heroes, statues of which can be found in the Black Citadel. Cha society is built around the Cha military chain of command, which every Cha is bound to respect. The true head of the chain of command is the Kano, considered the primus imperator, the rank above the imperators of all four high legions and coordinator of all the armies of the Cha. There is currently no Khan, or not even now, not even now, not even with the story as it is, because no Cha holds the leadership artifact, the core of the Kano. Now the Cha nation is therefore currently led a cryptocracy oligarchy built around the four high legions. Each legion has a primus warband, which the legion is named after and is led by an imperator, a descendant of the original Khan Ur. Now, if any imperator can obtain the claw and perform a great deed, that Cha will become the next Khan Ur. All of the four legions are fiercely independent from one another, maintaining their own lands and city-state strongholds. Three of the prime legions, Ash, Blood and Iron, are allied and work together to maintain their lands and push for military conquest of the lands outside those already held by the Char. The fourth legion, Flame, has historically been outcast and at civil war with the other legions. No legion allows the other three to rule over them. In times of emergency, the High Legions are known to hold defense quorums in which the highest ranking members meet to plan out a solution, to repel enemies, to manage refugees, whatever is required. Now, there is a lot more Char Law, and if you're interested in that, links above to my two Char Law videos talking about their history, their conflicts, their leaders. It's all very fascinating. But we come to the end. I hope you have enjoyed my Storm Caller showcase and the little law aside. Do let me know the weapon skins you're interested in and what you think is going to happen with the Char going forward before and after the events of no quarter. Please do like this video if indeed you did like it, share it if the spirits move you, subscribe and ring that bell if you think I've earned it, and please do show some love to Cody, Kildare, Cub, Molini, Jolly Joe Star, Dark Griever, and all my wondrous and fabulous Patreons without whom I would be unable to dedicate the time and resources I do to my channel. I can never thank you all enough. If you'd like to join my band of nerdy awesomeness, links to my Patreon page below. And if you feel inspired to jump into Guild Wars 2, there are referral links down there to the free-to-play game and the Path of Fire expansion, which now includes all the content from the Heart of Thorns expansion too, thanks to the generosity of ArenaNet and their partner program, of whom I am a proud affiliate. Using any of these referral links directly supports my channel, but costs you not a penny more. Now I hope you'll come back and join me again very soon for more Guild Wars 2 goodness, but... Until then, stay safe, stay awesome, and as always, game on.